Okay, so we should be live. Hopefully. Yep, looks like it. Uh, okay, so well, uh, since I was a big dum dum and forgot my iPad, uh, we'll have to do this on the computer instead. So, um, <clears throat> let's actually uh, let me start with two things. The first is, let's see, where did I put them? Here we go. Uh, I need to put this up on Canvas, but uh, I, I wrote some notes last semester on uh, Floating Point, which you can think of as sort of a replacement for the section of the book that talks about Floating Point. Um, the The only real difference between the two is the um, when the book talks about Floating Point, it doesn't include the sort of hidden, hidden uh, one that we can assume. Uh, so... Our version of it is gets you one extra bit worth of accuracy. So, um, okay. So the stuff that we still need to, to kind of talk through. Last time we encoded a, um, I think what did we do? Like two and a half or something. Uh, just a, a simple floating point number. We figured out whatever it was, and so we encoded it. Uh, we want to do more of that. We also want to take numbers that have already been encoded and decode them, okay? And then sort of the last thing is then how do you do arithmetic if you have multiple floating point numbers, right? So if I wanted to add two floating point numbers, what do I have to do? Um, and as we'll see, that can turn out to be kind of a kind of a hairy mess. Um, but for the moment, let's, uh, let's actually go over to um, the float toy website that we were looking at, um, and let's see, we'll switch to full screen on the stream. Let's look at the uh, this float toy um, app, and hopefully the stream will switch, there it goes. Oh, and it's, okay, this is annoying. Um, that is not what it's supposed to be showing. All right, let me uh, reconfigure this real quick. Window capture, create new window, Safari, okay. Okay, um, we'll just do that. And, okay, there we go. Um, so, got our little uh, float toy application. Uh, and in particular, one of the things I like about uh, when you pull this thing up is that it has three numbers sort of preloaded as examples, uh, namely just pi, but in the 1632 and 64-bit formats. Um, okay, and now the number pi from math, what is pi? Like, not numerically, but like sort of geometrically, what does it mean? Do I need to send you all back to middle school? Yeah, probably. Okay. Yes, Cole. Okay. Yeah, it's the ratio of the circumference to the diameter. And the reason that we use the letter pi for it is because the word for circumference in Greek is peripheria, the perimeter or periphery of it. Okay. And that starts with the letter pi. Great. Um, so it's defined to be the ratio between the circumference of a circle and the diameter of the circle. And um, then, as you guys hopefully remember from middle school and whatever, right, uh, if you express that as a decimal, what's the problem with it? It goes on forever. It never ends, okay? You cannot express that number um, as a non-terminating decimal, okay, um, which is unfortunate because 
you know, that means it goes on forever. And it means that in practical computation, if you're doing a computation that involves pi, then you are sort of, there's going to be an inexactness built into the, to the question, and there's nothing you can do about that. The only decision you can make is how precise do you want it, and obviously the more precise you want your answer, the more work you got to do. Okay, so you just have to, to decide uh, how bad or good you want your numbers, yeah. Depends on the calculator. Yeah, so I think most calculators probably go out to like nine or ten decimal points. Um, like you're just like, well, this thing doesn't even have pi on it. Um, there's a little cheesy, looks like a insurance salesman's calculator because it says AARP Auto Insurance Program on here. So, yeah. Um, okay, anyway. The yeah, so if like you've got your basic scientific calculator that you might use for a science class, um, probably nine or ten decimal points. Um, the uh, uh, did any of you guys have like you know the TI 84s or Inspires or whatever when you were in high school? Those I think went out to about that many digits, roughly. Uh, if you had something really fancy, then you know maybe it goes out a little bit further. But, but actually, that kind of begs a really good question, which is, for, for practical purposes, how much do you need to take it out for it to actually not matter anymore that you've rounded? And good question, right? So to how many decimal points is good enough for government work? So, uh, and this actually is one reason I, I, I like uh, being able to pull up float toys. So how many decimal points do we get in uh, if we use the 64-bit representation? I mean, we could count it here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 spots after the decimal is uh, what we get as a 64-bit encoding. Does that seem like a lot? Not a lot? What do you guys think? I mean, this is kind of a just what's your gut feeling question. Seems like it'd be pretty accurate, not very accurate. So here's a fair question then. How many digits does NASA use if they're going to send a space probe someplace? That seems like a pretty good, uh, pretty good me metric for how good the answer is. And, and the answer is actually... NASA uses 64-bit floating point for interplanetary missions, right? So if we want to send a space probe to Mars, 64 bits is good enough for NASA, so it probably ought to be good enough for us, okay? Um, there is a 128-bit float, floating point standard, um, and I think the only people that actually use it for anything would be like NASA, where it wants to simulate the entire galaxy kind of precision. Right, but that's that's kind of getting into like super matrix territory, and um, yeah. Okay, so sixty four bits eh, ought to be good enough for anybody, right? Um, okay, so uh, the the question, let's look at the sixteen bit standard here. What's the best that you can get pi in sixteen bits? Three point one four one. Okay, that's not particularly accurate. It's definitely not up to NASA kind of standards, but 3.14 is probably the the number that you guys all memorized in school, and for most practical computations, you just used that. Okay, so 3.141, yeah, that's pretty pretty much in line with your your middle school version of pi. Uh, or 22 over 7. How many of you guys memorized it that way as fraction? Huh? It's over 7. Not two. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. Except you can't get it exact, sadly. So, um, yeah, there's no way to do that. So, so our question today is, how would we encode pi in 8-bit floating point? How good can we get it? Um, 
And we can actually kind of cheat and use the 16-bit representation here to get started because the mantissa is going to be, notice that the mantissa starts the same in all of these, right? The, the only question with the mantissa is how it continues, okay? So looking at the mantissa, what do we see for this one? We got one, zero, zero, one, and then a bunch of other stuff. How many bits do we have for the mantissa if we're doing this in eight bits? Oh, sorry, let me back up. For uh, 8 bit encoding, right, we only have eight total bits. How many of those do we use for the mantissa? Four. Okay. So, uh, looking at the first four bits of the 16 bit version means there's our mantissa bits. Okay. Uh, we can't use any more than that because, well, we're only going to use four bits. Okay. So, uh, so we now know what our mantissa is supposed to be, just 1001, okay? The uh, exponent will actually be look very similar, okay? So this is, again, the nice thing about the pattern. Um, oh, <laughs> so Koi, uh, uh, in this uh, Twitch chat, says that 39 digits of pi is enough to calculate the circumference of the known universe to the width of one hydrogen atom. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty accurate, I would say. Uh, that assumes, of course, that the observable universe is circular um, or, you know, sp spherical, um, but, you know, then we're getting into complicated physics. So, anyway. Um, so the, the nice thing here, notice what the exponent fields are for all three of the schemes here for the 16, 32, and 64-bit versions. What do you notice about them? Yeah, okay. In this case, it's one followed by all zeros, but maybe another way to say that would be they're kind of the same thing, Okay. I mean, they're not really the same, but they look very much the same. Okay, so how many bits do we uh, use for our um, uh, exponent if we're working in the 8-bit system? Three. Okay, and then that leaves the last, the eighth bit for the sign. Okay, so if we're going to use three bits, what should our exponent be for, uh, for pi? Well, what's the, the, the bits for it? What would it be? One, zero, zero. Okay. And then we're, we're talking about the positive version of the number. So what's our uh, X, I mean, our sine bit? Zero. Okay. So um, let me switch over to um, Mathematica. And let me go over here. I'm just going to type here in Mathematica. Uh, for sake of uh, demonstration. Okay, so what we just said is, let me blow up the font quite a bit, that we would have this number. Okay, like so. Um, okay, zero, 0100, zero, zero. and let me actually put some spaces in here Okay, uh, ignore the little X's that it's putting in between. Uh, we don't care about that. So uh, the reason I'm just going to put in the spaces is so we can kind of split off the three different fields, sine, exponent, mantissa. Okay, so we said that this ought to be the encoding of pi in uh, with our 8-bit scheme. Okay, sort of going by analogy from the 16-bit scheme. Now, the question is, what is this actually equal to? We already know it's not going to be flat out equal to pi, right? It can't be. So it's going to be something that's really close to pi. In 16 bits, what was it? 
right? So the question is, what is this number? Is it 3.14, 3.2, 3.12, right? What is it? Okay. Um, okay, so here's how we're going to have to figure that out. Um, what's our mantissa? 1001, right? Okay, but with the mantissa, what really do we have? Huh? Um, well, okay. Uh, not yet. Because remember, the mantissa is the stuff that'll go after the, the radix. Right, so we need to get the radix in there. Okay. Because uh, it actually would be... Um, yeah. So when we write a number, how are we writing it? We're writing it as negative one to the sine bit. Oops, sorry. When I say one, I mean negative one. Negative one to the sine bit times one point MMMM, where that stands for the, what the mantissa bits are, times two to the exponent minus bias. Okay, so this is our scientific notation form, right? So we've got one point stuff times two to the something. And then the negative one to the S out front just means is it positive or negative? Okay, uh, in this case, we already know it's positive because um, we're not idiots. Okay, so is that okay? All right, now why is it uh, that I have one point MMMM. How is it that I know that there's a one before the radix? Huh? It's always one. Okay. Because what's the what's the rule from scientific notation from like grade school? You only ever put a non-zero digit before the decimal point. Well, how many non-zero digits are there for us to choose from if we're working in binary? Just one of them, right? That's kind of nice. Can't pull this trick in any other base. Um, and then we've got the, so why is it that I typed four M's after the radix here? Because how many bits do we use for our uh, mantissa in this scheme? Four. Okay, so just whatever that bit pattern is, it, it, I'll just call it MMMM, okay, for the mantissa. All right, and then we've got the exponent field, but we have to take into account the exponent bias. Okay, what is the exponent bias if we're working in eight bits? Do you guys remember? It was three, okay? So the exponents all look three bigger than they in fact are. So, if we take our particular number here, what do we have? We have um, negative 1 to the s, what's the sine bit in our case, for this example, 0. Okay, so I won't even type it because we know it's 0. Okay. Um, so, we have 1 point what? 1, 0, 0, 1. So, why did I put that there? because that was my mantissa field. So I literally just write it down, type it in this case, right? Okay, times two to the something. Well, what does the exponent look like? So the exponent's one, zero, zero. What is that as an integer? What is that, an unsigned integer? Hmm? Uh, the the exponent. What is the exponent? It's one zero zero, correct? Yeah, we can oh, yeah, all yeah. see that. What is that? Four. What does it really count as? Why? Because of the bias. Okay, so it looks like four, counts like one. Um, and notice how this direction. So last time we took a number and we encoded it. Right now, what we're basically doing is decoding it. And you add or subtract depending on which way you're going. Last time we added because we were going from 
uh, normal human representation into the 8-bit scheme. Here I subtract off the exponent because I'm decoding. Okay, the, the, the bias here is the annoying part of this, um, and, but you'll, you'll get used to it, I hope. Okay, um, all right, so what did we say that the exponent looks like? Looks like four counts as one. Okay, so so let me write this as um, it would help if I type on the correct keyboard. Let me write it as four minus three. Okay, because um, that uh, that's what we actually have. But of course, what is four minus three? One, right? Okay, so this would be 1.1001 times 2 to the first. Okay. All right, good so far. We? Oui? Uno. Who's the van Kestu? What? Buku de Kestu? Okay, so four, how did I get four for the exponent? Well, what is the exponent? It's these three bits. As an integer, what is one zero zero? Four, right? Because what's this position? That's the ones place, there's no ones. There's no twos. There's a four. Okay, so that's told me the exponent is a four. Why do I subtract three? I always subtract three for eight bits. That's just thou shalt subtract three. Um, okay, good. All right, so we got that. Now we're almost done. So we're down to here. What does multiplying by two to the first do to a number? Or to this bit pattern? It, yes. <laughs> That's not what I meant. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, of course, multiplying by two doubles the number, right? Um, but what, uh, in terms of the radix, what does it do? It just moves it one spot to the right. Okay, so remember when I used to work at Kohl's, that thing? Yeah, okay. So doubling or halving uh, in binary, all you have to do is move your decimal point, or radix in this case, however many spots. Okay, so if I've got my exponent here is a one, what that really means to do is move the radix one position to the right. Okay, and if I wanted to have the number, then I would move the radix one position to the left. Okay, does that make sense? So here's our number as a binary decimal, which is a bad word for it, but whatever. Um, and so to decode this, all we just have to do is think about the place value of everything. So what is the place value of stuff to the left of the radix? This thing that I've highlighted is in which position? Once, yeah, question? Yes. Well, it's close to pi, right? It's gonna be an approximation. Our question is how good is it, right? So this is in the ones place, correct? Okay, what about the digit to the left of it? Or the bit, excuse me. It's in the twos place. So what do we have before the radix? This is three. Okay, that's good because pi is three point something, right? So we're, excuse me, doing all right. What about the stuff after the radix? Well, what are the place values as you move to the right? What happens each time? They have each time you move to the right, okay? So the first point, or the first spot after the radix is the what's place? The half's place. And then to the right of that is the quarter's place, or fourth place. And to the right of that is the eighth place. 
okay? Uh, now, in this case, we have zeros in the halves and the quarters place, yes? Okay, just that's what we got. Uh, but we have a one in the eighths place. So what is this number really? 3.125, exactly. Okay, and that's the best that you can get pi in eight bits, is three and an eighth. Little off? Definitely not going to send a space probe to Mars with this. Okay, but also nobody really actually works in eight bits. Okay, the only reason that we use this is because it's easier to write down. Um, Henry, question? No. Okay. Um, now this is somewhat apropos. Um, yeah, go ahead, Evan. Sorry. Ah. Let me write it a different way. Is that better? So what is one, one, three, half, quarter, eight. So this is three plus no halves, no quarters, and one eighth, correct? But what's an eighth in, as a decimal? 0.125, right. Okay, so, um, uh, oops, yeah, so 3.125, um, and this actually is uh, probably the one instance where it's useful that we are in uh, the United States, because how many of you guys knew that one-eighth was 0.125 just because you've, like, measured lumber in your life, right? Exactly. You, you, we know the, the decimal conversions of quarters, eighths, halves, and sixteenths probably. Maybe not the sixteenths. But you guys use those things all the time if you're measuring stuff because that's how we break up an inch is into halves, quarters, eighths, and sixteenths. Um, it kind of sucks that we do that because it means that we don't do things the way the rest of the world does. But for this one instance, it's useful. Um, yeah. So uh, a couple years ago, I was up in Canada for uh, a couple months, uh, and I went to a Home Depot up there to get uh, some boards and two by fours for a project. Uh, and like everything else in Canada, so they they are fully metricized there, except at Home Depot. You want to go buy dimensional lumber? It's still in imperial units. So I start telling the guy, yeah, I need uh, about a meter. You know, I need some two by fours. I need them cut to about a meter in length. And then this other one needs to be a meter and, you know, four centimeters the, so I can make a nice square and frame it off good. And he's like, no, 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 stop. We use imperial for this. It's like, oh, thank goodness. Give me a two by four. And, yeah. So anyway. Uh, and, of course, how many of you guys know that a 2x4 isn't actually a 2x4? Isn't that annoying? <laughs> Why is a 2x4 not a 2x4? Huh? Well, there's that, but also it uh, takes into account the thickness of the drywall when you put that on, right? Uh, so, anyway. You know, as since we all um, are building houses all the day, right? Um, okay, so, uh, yes, Koi. So Koi's question is, uh, does this mean that all rationals and irrationals can have whatever is behind the radix be converted into a sum of half multiples? Uh, almost. It would be a sum of 1 over 2 to the n. Okay, so, like, let's say that we had had a all ones right there, then what would this have been? A half plus a quarter plus an eighth. Okay, and if we had more positions, 1632 and so on. Um, so uh, maybe the, the, the salient point of his question is, um, so he mentioned the words rational and irrational. What do those mean in the mathematical context? Okay, so... In everyday speech, rational and irrational mean, you know, Cole, man, he's such an idiot. 
seems so irrational. Um, okay, uh, but what 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 do we mean by that in a mathematical sense? Hmm. A fraction of integers. Okay, so a rational number you can express as one integer divided by another integer. Okay, so, um, you know, 3.125 is rational. Okay, because I could write it as 3 plus an eighth, and then if I did common denominators, it'd be what, 25 eighths? Okay, so I can do that. Uh, an irrational number cannot be written in that form. Okay, so what, what are good examples of irrationals, other than pi? Because we've already got that one on the table. One-third irrational? Ah, good question. One-third. Well, that's a ratio of integers, isn't it? One to three. Oh, the that's also rational. Oh, it is? Mm -hmm. Because it's 22, an integer, and 7, another integer, and you just form the ratio between them by dividing. Ah, exactly. Okay, so pi itself is not rational. But 22 over 7, 3.141592, whatever, right? Any approximation of pi that, that you know and use, those are all rational. Okay, so you guys see the distinction? That, that's kind of a subtle point for 8.30 in the morning. But, um, yeah. Uh, okay, so what's an example of a number other than pi? Because we've already abused him enough. That is a... Um, Irrational number. There's a lot of stuff in the unit circle that is irrational, yes. Give me an example. Uh, without using pi. Sorry. <laughs> huh? Yeah, root 3 over 2, fine. Um, but square root of 2, square root of 3, square root of 5. Uh, in fact, uh, the square root of 2 was how the concept of irrationality was sort of discovered in the first place uh, back in the day in ancient Greece. And there's some variations on the tale to what happened to the poor schmuck who figured that out. Uh, his name was Hippasus of Metapontum. Uh, so he was a member of the Pythagorean school. And the Pythagoreans were just as much a religious cult as they were a band of mathematics lovers, okay? Um, they had all kinds of crazy rules, the most amusing of which I found was that they were all vegetarians, or uh, maybe technically vegans, I'm not sure. Um, but they were vegetarians, but they also did not eat beans, Okay, now in ancient Greece, it's not like you could just go to your local Kroger and get like a tofu burger, right, patty. Uh, right, so if you were vegetarian and you didn't eat beans, like that was a little, you were, you were cutting down your available foodstuffs pretty significantly. What I think is hilarious is why did they not eat beans? I mean, what do you guys think, right? I mean, it's a root. Let's all go back to when we were eight years old. Beans. Huh? Yeah, they cause flatulence. Yes? And that's exactly what, uh, there's a biography of Pythagoras written by another guy named Iamblichus. And in that biography he says, and they do not eat beans for they are flatulent. Okay, so it's basically the ancient Greek version of Beans, Beans, the Musical Fruit. Um, okay, anyway, so this guy, Hippasus, uh thought about, okay, what would happen if I tried to figure out the ratio of the side of a square with the diagonal of the square? So let's say that I've got a square that's one unit on its side. What is its diagonal accordingly? It's one unit on the side. Then it's one unit on this side, and Pythagoras' theorem says that square root of 2 is the length of that diagonal, right? So he said, okay, well, what's the ratio between the side and square root of 2? And figured out that there could be no ratio. It was an irrational number. 
And this caused uh, a little bit of a meltdown in the Pythagorean school because one of the other tenets of the, them was that all is number. Everything is perfect, rational, harmonious, and can be described through numbers. So then they found something that couldn't, and uh, needless to say, that was a problem. So the stories for what happened to poor Hippasus um, are, there, there's a few of them. One was that he was burned at the stake as a heretic. Uh, two, that what he was burned at the stake for was not actually the discovery, but communicating it outside the Pythagorean school. Another story was that they built a tomb as if he had died and expelled him from the society, uh, that he was struck by lightning, uh, and that he was thrown off of a boat, right? So there's quite a bit of variations on the tale as to what happened to this poor guy, none of them good. Um, well, unless the physics department consists of time machine, we'll never know exactly what happened. Um, but anyway, um, all right. So, so what does this mean? Uh, this rational versus irrational discussion in mathematics, there are rational and irrational numbers. Now this part might blow your mind. How many rational numbers are there? Well, we would expect that to be an infinite number, right? Just like there are an infinite number of integers. How many irrationals are there? It's also infinite. What's the relative size, if you will, between those? Yes. Okay, this part might blow your mind, but there are more than one size of infinity. Okay. And if you really want to learn more about that, then come come bug me sometime. But yes, there are way more irrationals than there are rationals. Okay, in fact, there are few enough rationals that I could write down a list of every rational number. Okay, it would take me forever, but I could write it down. Rational number one is this, two is that, three is this. I could list them numerically. Cannot do that with irrationals. There's too many. Um, lines, cranial explosions yet? Maybe I should, uh, actually, you know what I need is a meme generator thing where like I hit the button and then you guys know the like, the, the guy in the like black turtleneck sweater who's got like this, the explosions coming off of his head. No, meme? No, it's a, it's a let me find it. Um, if we're going to have humor, we better have good humor. Um, this one. Yeah, here we go. Here's the GIF version. I have no idea who he is. Right. That one. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, um, but what this means for the sake of a computer, which of course is why we're all here, is that to a computer, there are no irrational numbers. Everything is rational on a computer in floating point, right? And it's because we go out a fixed number of bits, 8, 16, 30, whatever, right? And that's it. So you cannot encode an irrational number on a machine. So this maybe is a problem if you're a mathematician, because what do you do? Yeah, no matter what number you're working with, you have to choose basically some uh, approximation of it. You cannot write down the square root of two in a computer as a numerical quantity, okay? What you can do instead is write down a decimal or base two decimal, right? 1.414 or back to pi, right? This number down here at the bottom, this is not equal to pi, 3.14, blah, 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 blah. It's just really, really, really close. 
Okay, and it's close enough that like we can send space probes to Mars and not have them, you know, miss and hit Saturn or something. Uh, so it's good enough for, for that purposes, but it's still rational. Um, okay, so that may seem a little weird that um, uh, the computer is sort of not a perfect representation of human arithmetic, but we've actually already seen that problem, right? How do integer storage work? It's more like a clock than it is a, um, a number line. Okay, so again, that, that just them's the breaks. Uh, okay, so what did we say the best that we could get for pi was in this? Um, 3.125 is the best you can get for pi in 8 bits. Okay, um, and then those are the, the best you can get in 16, 32, and 64 bits. Um, so... One of the one of my projects, we'll see when I can find some time to sit down and do it, is um, so Evan uh, has posted. I mean, in addition to this page, he's also got the source code for what runs it, and uh, so a project that I have will be to sit down and add to his source code the eight bit flavor, so that we can, uh, and maybe the one twenty eight bit while I'm at it, just because that'd be kind of fun, right? To, to see how good you can get pi in that uh, that scheme. Um, anyway, uh, okay. Let me uh, pause uh, for questions, preguntas, and or fragments. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Well, I mean, your your finger is has a width to it, right? Um, uh, yeah. Well, okay. L maybe let me maybe rephrase this. So you're not actually touching any numbers at all. You're touching a whiteboard. Right. Right. You're. But what you're doing is you're making a conceptual thing to say, okay, I'm going to think of this as being a number line. And so this line that I draw on the board is conceptually the number line, a, a physical manifestation of it. But it's not as if the number zero is sitting right there in the middle of the number line. What is the number zero? It's something up here, not there, right? I mean, this is kind of a deep philosophical question. So what are you touching? You're touching atoms and molecules that make up the yeah. the thing, and you're just saying, okay, the molecules in this position, I'm going to call the number zero, sort of, right? Um, now, maybe maybe this is what you're really asking: is is the universe? Is there sort of a a um, how to put this? Okay, so imagine you got a piece of graph paper. Okay. And you're going to put dots at the intersections of the grids. And you want to draw something. Okay, perfectly good. Well, what's going to happen if your graph paper is really, really fine? You can draw a more accurate picture, right? But what about if you say, okay, I'm not allowed to draw a dot that's not on a grid line. Okay, it's got to be at the intersection of two grid lines. Right? Is the universe like that just on a really small scale we don't know yeah so i need to pull back up our <clears throat> right mind blown jeff yeah we don't know um if you want to think about this more uh we have a philosophy department i invite you to uh no it's okay um, all right. Well, why don't we, um, any other questions? We can maybe quit a little early today. Um, okay. So preview of coming attractions. So what do we have yet to do? We've encoded, we've decoded. Okay. We should probably go through at least another example of both of those. Okay. So we'll do that next time. 
Uh, and then the last thing, and this is where a lot of work we'll have to spend, is how do you do arithmetic with these things? So if I give you two floating point numbers, how do you actually do the addition or subtract or whatever, right? How do you do arithmetic with them? Okay, so that's uh, that's where we're going. So that'll probably take us most of the rest of this week. Um, and then that should mean that next week we can start talking about how do you store text in a computer, right? So we've sort of talked about integers, both signed and unsigned. We spent a good chunk of time on floating point. And then we'll say, okay, well, if you want to type a word processor, you know, write a paper, how do, how do your, the letters get stored? Um, yeah. Okay, good? Good? Gucci? Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. So the question is, um, why is it in a signed integer, negative one is represented as all ones, and not that that represents, say, minus 128 or 120, whatever, right? So, okay. What is the system for representing signed integers that we've chosen? We chose this two complement system, right. right? Okay. So you could come up with another system where negative 128 is all ones. That would be a system. It's just not our system. Okay. So why is negative one all ones? Well, what is one in binary? So let me, let me uh, get back to Mathematica here so I can type. Um, What is uh, one? Okay, that's one. And let me put um, space in there just for readability. All right, that's one. How do you negate a number in the two's complement system? You flip all the bits and then you add one. Okay, well, if I flip all these bits, what do I get? I get that, and if I add one, then I get that, and that's why, yeah. okay? So that's how you have to think about it. If you know, if like you want the representation of minus 17, first write down 17, flip the bits and add one, and what you get is minus 17, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah? Good, no, good question. All right, anything else, gentlemen? No? All right, well, I will see you guys on Wednesday, if not sooner.